I was the sixth generation of consoles, the greatest generation that ever was and still is. And for those that are wondering, the consoles that came out at that time were the PlayStation 2, the Nintendo GameCube, and last and honestly, certainly least, the original Xbox. Because let's face it, that thing was a glorified Halo and Ninja Gaiden machine. The only reason why people got an Xbox was just to dabble into early online console games. gaming but i digress you also might be saying hmm, how could you make an assertive statement about something that is completely subjective and up to your own personal opinion how could you possibly know for certain that the sixth generation was the best and you know if you argue that there was a better generation before slightly after or you know you could say that every generation has its moments you know i would say to that that you know your opinion is completely wrong and not for any good reason, but for the simple fact that I would not be making this video. I would not be editing this disaster if I wasn't absolutely certain that the sixth generation of consoles was the golden age of 3D gaming. You also might be thinking that this guy is completely biased since he grew up with the sixth generation of consoles. Well, listen here, Mr. Strawman argument that I pulled out of my ass completely. The sixth generation of consoles wasn't the only generation of consoles that I grew up with. I grew up with the fourth, fifth, and finally the seventh generation. And I could have any personal nostalgia to any of those generations, but it's the sixth one in particular that I considered the best, and for a pretty good reason. While I was looking at my PlayStation 3 library, a huge percentage of those games were just HD ports and collections of PlayStation 2 games. I never grew up with a PlayStation 2. I had to get the console recently. I was a GameCube kid, but it's painfully obvious to me that the PlayStation 2 was the greatest console ever made. And this is coming from somebody that did not grow up with a PS2. And the reason why I think that is not for the console's hardware or its specifications or any of that technical bullshit, but for the sole purpose, for the sole reason that it had the largest and most diverse library out of any console ever made, period. And to be honest, I don't think I've seen any console generation come close to what the PlayStation 2 and GameCube generation did. So what the hell does the golden age of anything even mean? Am I just listening off of buzzwords just to sound smarter and get some clickbait? I mean, kind of a little. I mean, you gotta work the YouTube algorithm, but moving on from that, I would argue that my own personal definition for what a golden age is, is a ripe moment within a medium's history when the technology has finally advanced enough for that medium to be expressed in its full potential. So I would argue that the golden age for film was in the 60s and 70s and to a lesser extent the 80s, since this was a moment in film's history when for the first time, mainstream movies all had color, sound, a decent length and orchestras. And the movies that came out at that time which is good for the time they came out in. They were timeless classics. You had movies like The Good, The Bad, The Ugly, The Godfather, and Star Wars. And again, these weren't just good movies for the time they came out in. To this day, we are still trying to reach the standards that those movies set for film. And we are still making remakes and revisions of those movies or movies that are influenced from them. So yes, this is my point. That would be the golden age for film. I would also like to make a point that the sixth generation of consoles wasn't gaming's only golden age. Well, how could you have more than one golden age of anything? Well, gaming is significantly different than any other medium that came before it. You have 2D gaming, 3D gaming, and sometime in the future, maybe we'll be in the matrix enjoying virtual reality. But my main point is none of these types of gaming are comparable to one another. They are all separate and distinct from one another. And I consider the sixth generation the best generation because, you know, that's the most advanced technology we have, 3D gaming. And, you know, virtual reality gaming hasn't come along yet. And I would consider the golden age of 2D gaming to be the fourth generation of gaming. That is the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis. The generation that came before it was a little sloppy because, you know, the technology wasn't fully advanced enough for developers to implement the kinds of visions they imagined in their heads. 
and also nobody knew how to make a 2d side scrolling game or an rpg or an adventure game developers just had to experiment they had to throw what everything they had at a wall just to see what sticks and eventually they figured it out sometimes within that own generation too i mean nintendo figured out how to make mario capcom figured out Mega Man, but there were also a lot of slips and stumbles along the way because let's be honest here there's a reason why the original metroid had to be remade uh, it's because the original metroid is a hot mess the game is a disaster uh, for starters every background looks the same there's no map so it's easy to get lost the tile sits all look similar the bosses are a complete shit and the game, it's just, it did not age well in the slightest. There's a reason why they had to remake it. But then one generation later, within the fourth generation, developers fully figured out how to make 2D games. Super Metroid is not just a good Metroid game, it is one of the best games ever made. It took what worked in the original Metroid and expanded on it and fixed all the problems. Now you had a mapping system. Now you had a fantastic atmospheric soundtrack. But more importantly, all the environments were unique and distinct from one another to a point that even though the game did have a map system, you didn't need to use it. You could get by completely fine off of your own memory just based off of the game's landmarks and environmental storytelling. And to be honest, yes, that generation aced it for 2D gaming. RPGs got figured out with Chrono Trigger and Final Fantasy VI. Action games like Mega Man X. Need I go on? Everybody knows it. There is a reason why the SNES Classic consistently outsells the NES Classic. It's because people know where the good games are at. So one reason why the sixth generation of consoles is the golden age of 3D gaming is that it had the luxury of coming after the fifth generation. And just like how the NES set the groundwork and the foundations for the generation that would follow it, the PlayStation 1 and the Nintendo 64 did all the hard work and experimentation to see what worked in a 3D setting. And one thing we learned was that if you wanted to move a character around in 3D, you needed analog controls, and the PlayStation 1 didn't even release initially with an analog controller. That was an accessory that released after the fact when the damage had already been done, but I digress. The point is, is that a lot of those games didn't age too well, and let's just look at a base level. Let's look at the graphical leap in quality between the PlayStation 1 and the PlayStation 2. It added novelty. If you grew up at that time, this was the largest leap in graphical quality of all time. Ever since then, every generation has only subtly or incrementally increased graphical fidelity, just bit by bit. But let's just compare PlayStation 1 Solid Snake to PlayStation 2 Big Boss. The difference is mind-blowing. PlayStation 1 Solid Snake is a blocky warpy mess who doesn't even have a face he just has a smeared texture and when he talks in cutscenes, he doesn't even flap his lips he just bobbles his head up and down like a shitty 2007 halo machine but then you reach the playstation 2 and these 3d models are just gorgeous snake no longer has an interpretation of a face he has a face he has an eyes a nose and a mouth all capable of showing his own emotions, capable of showing sadness, joy, sorrow, just everything. And the graphics just look phenomenal. Now, that isn't to say that the PlayStation 2 or the Nintendo GameCube could capture photorealistic graphics, but if developers were smart enough to stylize their graphics, then those games tended to age better. And one of the reasons why Metal Gear Solid, Solid Snake, and Big Boss, and Resident Evil 4's character models looked so fantastic, and one of the reasons why they age so good is that they are not based off of a photorealistic interpretation of what a person looks like. They are based off of an artist rendition of what a person looks like. Big Boss is not based off a human being, he's based off of Yoji Shinkawa's phenomenal artwork, and that's why the graphics back then, if handled properly, aged pretty well and now graphics were incredible enough that developers could get become creative and stylize their artwork. Okami experimented with cell shaded graphics and the game just looks like the way it was intended. It looks like an ancient Japanese painting. That is how well it looked back then. You know, some other developers slipped and stumbled along the way. Uh, Grand Theft Auto character models didn't age so well because they made the mistake of trying to be photorealistic and look like real people. Which, while looked good at the time, doesn't look so good nowadays. But my point is, is that, damn, at a first glance, 
The graphics for this console generation were godlike. All right, come over here. Come closer. Uh, I'm going to let you guys in on a secret, you know, having good graphics and, you know, a nice art style is nice and all. But that doesn't mean shit if your game plays like complete trash. What separates video games from any other art form in existence is the fact that there is player control and consequences. What separates video games from movies is all in the gameplay. But luckily, every 3D genre of gaming went through this cycle of first trying out the genre, then experimenting upon it, and then perfecting it. And that all happened within this generation. And you could see that pretty blatantly with Rockstar's Grand Theft Auto series. You know, first they tried out 3D open world game design with Grand Theft Auto 3. Then they experimented upon it with Vice City and then perfected it with San Andreas. And San Andreas wasn't just a good 3D open world game for the time it came out in. To this day, we are still trying to reach the standard that that game set. Even games coming out nowadays aren't as detailed as what happened in San Andreas. Cyberpunk 77 is an unfinished mess and you can't do half as many things in that game as you could in San Andreas. This was the generation of gaming that perfected my favorite genre, the character action game. And character action games can be best described as games where the combat is melee focused on performing stylish combos all within a 3D space. And the game that best represents that statement was Devil May Cry. Devil May Cry was a bold step into 3D action games. And what did we have to base that off of? Rising Zan, Samurai Gunman, a PS1 game that's a cult classic that, let's be honest here, nobody really played. But other than that, Devil May Cry was almost like the 3D version of a fighting game. There were directional inputs, you could perform combos, and you could launch enemies in the air, you could juggle them even with your guns, which was absolutely mental. You had pause combos, which prevented players from spamming attacks all the time. And it was awesome. Yeah the series was experimented upon with a game we don't want to talk about, Devil May Cry 2, and then perfected with Devil May Cry 3. Devil May Cry 3, basically, Hideaki Itsuno threw every single gameplay mechanic he could possibly think of at the wall, and they all stuck. This was a game where you could switch between multiple styles. If you use Swordmaster or Gunslinger, you could increase the combo potential of either your guns or your melee weapons. If you switch to Trickster, you can move around like an anime character. You could teleport right in front of enemies or bosses' face and just fight them like that, and it was awesome. And then you had one of my favorite gameplay mechanics, the Royal Guard. And what the Royal Guard was, basically, it gave Dante the ability to block an enemy strike. And if you blocked an enemy strike right as it hit you, you could attack and deal massive damage. You could melt bosses' health bars like they were nothing, and it was just amazing. And then you could even use the doppelganger style. You could send out a shadow clone to attack enemies for you. You could stop time. You had the devil trigger. Just, you could do everything. This game is like pure anime. It's nuts and I love it. And I'll let you guys in on a little secret, but I'm a huge Metal Gear Solid fan. I know, who would have thought, right? But one of the reasons why the Metal Gear games are so good this generation was because Kojima wasn't afraid to experiment. Metal Gear Solid 2 told a strange meta narrative that we haven't seen anything like it to this day, but if you want to talk objectively speaking here, Metal Gear Solid 3 is one of the best stealth games ever made. It's a game where Kojima finally struck a nice cutscene to gameplay ratio, where if you skipped every cutscene in the game, the gameplay could stand on its own merits. But you wouldn't want to skip the cutscenes, because for the first time ever, Kojima finally stuck to a tone and kept with it the entire game, where the game presented itself as this James Bond meets Rambo type of experience and committed to the bit. This was a game where the level designs were completely open-ended. They were linear, but open-ended in how you wanted to complete them. You didn't have to kill a single enemy, except, you know, the big ass spoiler at the end of the game, but you could, you could navigate these environments in many different ways. You could distract enemies with dirty magazines. If you could think about it, you could do it. And if you weren't a Metal Gear fan, you could have played Splinter Cell, or Hitman. Hitman, which also was incredibly open-ended. You could find yourself a disguise on the fly and set up the perfect assassination attempt and then walk out completely unscathed. I could spend an entire video talking about the crazy shit you could do in Metal Gear Solid 3 and Hitman. That is how spoiled for choice you are with stealth games at this point in gaming. 
Gaming was also pretty diverse at this time. You didn't just have grim and dark military shooters. You had colorful mascot games. You had games like Ratchet and Clank, Mario Sunshine. You had Jack and Daxter. Every console had something for everybody at this time. And there's really not much I could talk about for 3D platformers, but they were alive and thriving at this time of gaming. And there was something for everybody. Metroid finally took that bold first step into 3D and it stuck the landing, which is surprising because back then everybody thought that Metroid Prime was looking to be a generic first person shooter, but what we got was one of the greatest 3D interpretations of the Super Metroid formula. This was a game which also took environmental storytelling to new heights. This was a game where if you scanned enemies and environments, that could almost tell a story better than any cutscene ever could. And the formula was further expanded upon in Metroid Prime 2 Echoes. But my main point is, they got it right the first time, which is pretty freaking amazing. Man, the survival horror genre is on complete life support nowadays. I don't know if you guys know this, but Resident Evil 8 was deliberately designed to be less frightening than Resident Evil 7 because a lot of people were too scared to play RE7. This is true. Capcom lost a huge chunk of sales to Resident Evil 7 for this specific reason, but back during the sixth generation, developers weren't afraid to push the envelope in terms of horror. To this day, Silent Hill 2 and 3 are considered the staples, the pinnacle of psychological horror, and we still haven't had anything that has come close to it. JRPGs also hit their apex at this point in time, and while Final Fantasy was kind of lagging behind, Atlas was knocking it out of the park with hit after hit. You had Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne, Digital Devil Saga 1 and 2, and of course you had the Persona series, you had Persona 3 and 4, which didn't just have mechanically sound combat, they had a unique way of telling a story where everything took place on a calendar and you had to manage your time well within that calendar. You had to choose between dungeon crawling or advancing your social links. This was a game that took role playing very seriously where you had to foster good bonds between your party members to succeed in this game. And they were some of the greatest games ever made. Look, I know what you're thinking. You could argue that there have been plenty of modern sequels to the video game series that I have just listed that play more mechanically sound than how they did in the sixth generation. Now you could say that Grand Theft Auto 5, Devil May Cry 5, Persona 5, man for whatever reason we just have a lot of amazing 5s that have come out in the past decade, but that's besides the point. The main reason why a game like Devil May Cry 5 plays more mechanically sound than how it did in number 3 is because all Hideaki Itsuno had to do for DMC5 was just tighten the gameplay mechanics that were already there, already tried and tested in the third generation. As a matter of fact, we don't get a lot of new and creative ideas coming from the AAA market anymore. And that's because AAA budgets are inflated to shit nowadays. It is expensive as hell to make a AAA game. Because they don't just make hang sculpted 3D models anymore. Nowadays, they will scan a real human being, a model or an object into the game. Developers like Capcom will pay out of their ass to have a fashion designer design clothing for their fictional characters to wear. And because of these bloated budgets, developers can't take any risks anymore. And what are the new and creative genres that have come out in the past decade in the 2010s? Well, the Souls genre. Now, why is the Souls genre a new and creative genre? Because it is an example of what happens when you have a healthy double A market. There are three major markets in gaming. The first market is the single A market, and these are your indie games, and indie games are usually created by only a handful of people. Sometimes, if you're a complete madman, they're only created by a single person like Pixel, like Daisuke Amiya. But other than that, these games, again, are made on a shoestring or negligible budget. No matter in fact, half the time, indie developers have to crowdfund in order to get their projects completed. But the upside of that is they can be completely creative and experimental in their game design. The only downside to this approach is that they don't have the budget to go nuts with whatever they want to create. The AAA market is the exact opposite of the single A market. These are your big budget game studios created by monolithically sized developers that house thousands of overworked and underappreciated employees. But the good thing about having budgets this big is that 
They have enough money to hire celebrity voice actors to create photorealistic graphics and to hire licensed music. But the downside to this is that that big budget comes at a big cost in creativity. Nobody wants to take a risk because taking a risk means all that money, all those employees that you have working for you, all of it will go down the drain if the game you come out with is crappy. So they tend to play it conservatively and not create anything new and original. But then there's this sweet spot right between single A and triple A. Bang! The double A gaming market is one of the most important gaming markets of all time. And the reason why double A game design is so important is because developers were in this unique situation where they were given too much of a budget to be considered indie, but not too much to be considered triple A, which meant they had all the benefits of indie game design where they could be creative and experimental with their game design and maybe actually succeed in doing so. And pretty much every amazing video game series that we take for granted nowadays started all in the double A market. I'm a big Devil May Cry fan and that game's history is magical. Basically, Hideki Kamiya was tasked with designing Resident Evil 4, but somewhere down the line, the game became way too action focused and started to turn into Devil May Cry. And the developers at Capcom just said, fuck it, go make your own action game with this. That kind of thing just doesn't happen nowadays. Look at Persona 3 and 4. Again, those are double A games. Or Silent Hill 2 and 3, double A games. Every video game series that we enjoy today started out as a double A game. Look at the new Ratchet and Clank. Ratchet and Clank started out as a double A gaming series. Without a double A market, video gaming is kind of stuck in a rut where we just redo the same thing over and over and make sequels to the things that already work and very rarely do people experiment and make new things i mean i'm a big fan of dark souls but the reason why dark souls and the soul series are amazing as they are is because they started out in the double a market and without a double a market how can gaming really advance and move on from here the sixth generation of consoles was also the final time in gaming where you could expect a video game to be a complete and finished product. Nowadays, when you buy a video game, and video games, I should mention, are fucking expensive. They can cost anything from $60 to $100. And you don't even have the luxury to know that all your hard-earned money is going to good use. Look at games like Fallout 76 or Cyberpunk 77. These games are unfinished buggy mess, not fit for human consumption. Like you cannot play these games. It is criminal that these games were even released the way they were in the state they were. The only analogy I could give you is that imagine that if you bought a movie and in all the CG action scenes, it cut from imagine a real person to a shitty model T-posing in the middle of the scene. This is the kind of thing that you could only expect in the gaming industry. And the good thing about the sixth generation is that while the PlayStation 2 and the Nintendo GameCube were limited, it was to the consumer's advantage. You know, the fact that the PS2 didn't have a hard drive or an internet connectivity right out of the gate meant that if you developed a game for the PlayStation 2, it better have been finished and completed right on the disc that you sold it to them. And if you didn't finish that game, your reputation as a developer would be irredeemably damaged. Look at Devil May Cry 2. While I love this gaming series, Devil May Cry 2 almost killed it. Hideaki Itsuno had to bust his ass off to make sure that Devil May Cry 3 was the masterpiece that it was. Otherwise, the game would have been completely dead in the water. But he did it and he made it work. And this is the point I'm saying that six generation games and you know what, all the generations prior to that were all finished. But nowadays, like if you buy a console, you can't even expect it to behave like a console. The whole point of a video game console is that it is supposed to be more easy and convenient to use than a gaming PC. When you buy a console, you shouldn't have to sit through updates or install times or patches, or for God's sakes, you should not have to sit there and update your operating system. You know, when you bought a PlayStation 2 or a Nintendo GameCube, it was as easy to use as a DVD player or a Blu-ray player. You just got the disc, you put it in the machine, and it worked. And sure, some games, you know, you may have had to sit through a few loading screens, but it was a small price to pay for actually having your money be sent to good use. 
All right, so what the hell is even the point of this video? Am I just becoming old? Am I becoming that old guy that yells at new things? Well, yeah, probably there's a little bit of that, but also I think that you guys are legitimately missing out on a lot. Video games are expensive as hell. They are the most expensive they've ever been. 70 to to $100 for a game at launch is a nightmare to me. I don't know how you guys could even afford to play this. I always get everything on sale, but moving on from that, those games, you can't even expect them to be completed at launch. And even if they are finished, um, publishers will still try to screw you over. They'll release DLC bit by bit that eventually costs more than the game or has more value than the game you originally paid money for. So you're essentially just buying a game for the right to buy the DLC, which is better than the game that you spent most of your money on. I mean, that happened so many times. It was Borderlands was notorious for that. But moving on from that, I really think that creativity is being kneecapped really hard. You know, developers like Capcom used to pump out new and innovative things all the time. They used to make games like God Hand, Beautiful Joe, and Okami, and they really just stick to the games that, again, they made in the sixth generation. It's just more Resident Evil, Devil May Cry, Monster Hunter, but I, they used to just innovate, and that was the norm for developers, and it isn't anymore. Nowadays, they'll just stick to trends. They might make an open world game, and that might be the biggest they step out of their comfort zone. But again, I think you guys are missing out on the mind. If you guys demand more, Maybe that golden age can come back again, but you know, you can always hope for the best.